The following program is sponsored by Seattle Open Door Church. Seattle Open Door Church is committed to loving God, loving people, and loving life. Our doors are open to whomever. No masks required. Seattle Open Door Church is located in downtown Burien next to the Southwest Courthouse. Host for There is Hope is Richard Dover, the senior pastor of Seattle Open Door Church in Burien. Richard Dover, you see your pastor Seattle Open Door Church. This is There's Hope TV. And uh, today we're interviewing Dennis Marcellano. Thank you, Dennis, for being with us. My pleasure. And in just a moment, we'll talk about uh, Dennis's a little bit about his story. But we're going to be looking at the 12 steps of AA. We're going to try to bibi apply biblical principles to them. I'm using the Life Recovery Bible here. If you're not familiar with it, it's a Bible that has uh, in the very front, it has the 12 steps listed in it. It has the Christian 12 steps and AA 12 steps. You go through the Bible, you're going to see a variety of topics that is covered. You look through the Bible, it'll have step one, it'll have step two, step six, whatever it may be. And then it turns around and has stories of individuals and their lives and how they applied the steps in their lives or how what they should have done so their life could have been different. Then in the back, there's a concordance that has several different topics on it that you can look up. Uh, addictions, alcohol, abuse, anger, arrogance, bitterness, bondage, all the different things that you can think of when it comes to addiction has a list of those things, 12 traditions. So it's a good Bible to be able just to read to get more familiar of how the steps are biblical steps and apply in your life. And last time, uh, Dennis, we talked about steps one through six. We're gonna get to step seven, but maybe somebody didn't watch the first show, so why don't you kind of introduce yourself, tell a little bit about who you are. Um, okay, let's see, I was an addict for 18 years. Um, a bunch of different types of addictions, alcohol, drugs, and then the non-physical uh, addictions like gambling. Said so sports. Sports, yeah. And, uh, oh yeah, I, I was, well, that's a long That's a whole, whole yeah. show, right? Yeah, yeah, I know just quickly what sports addiction is, is uh, people uh, ground their feeling of wanting to achieve, and they, and they tie it in with a, a team or a person, and they read their statistics, and they watch them on TV, and it goes nowhere in their personal lives. See? Yeah, yeah. So, so this, you know, this is kind of a little rabbit trail. But talk about that because uh, I know before we talked, you said that the person is trying to find their own identity in somebody else, and of course, you're never going to find your identity in somebody else. Right. Well, they identify with somebody else who is actually achieving, and then they're devastated if the team loses or you know. Um, so yeah, it's just sublimation. It's it's an addiction. It's not reality. It's not reality. And you believe people can have that kind of an addiction that is the most important thing in their life. <laughs> you were one of them. Oh, yeah. I mean, every start out every morning with watch, reading the uh, sports section. How did my teams do? You know, how did certain players do? Stats and all that stuff. You know, how did I do? It, it, yeah, how did you do? <clears throat> well, how did you work function today, you know, yeah. in the midst of that? Okay, and uh, so then you had uh, 18 years of addiction, right? And you have 35 years of addiction free, right? And will you be addiction free forever? Absolutely. You're not going to relapse on year 36 or 37. No, no way. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that. And then why don't you talk about some of the things that you tried? So we're we're looking at the 12 steps of AA, but we believe there's some biblical principles there, and you're really looking at the biblical principles than you are at the at the steps. Right. You know what? Here's what I, I'm going to wrap it all up in one thing. Okay. This is what it comes down to. Life is an experiment. And, you know, we, we try this, we get a result exp experientially. We try this, we marry this person, we go to this thing, and, you know, we have problems that we're trying to get rid of. And uh, so we, we, there's a bunch of things to try. So life's an experiment. And, you know, using alcohol and drugs is one of those experiments, you know, to try to feel good. Or like in the case of sports, it's easier to read the, the sport page than it is to, you know, get Go out the job. There. Yeah, yeah. And so, um, so anyway, yeah. So life's an experiment. So, Bible is also full of experiments. We try this. What's the result? You know, we try this. That in the world, what's the result? So, my thing is, is I, at one point I did totally just fall in love with the Bible and just had total uh, confidence that it was going to lead me in the right direction. 
but I, I, I didn't know for sure yet. And so I had to keep trying different things. And it says, especially things that the society is just not into, you know, being submissive and being humble. And right. So, but it, it worked. Okay. Experiments. All right, so let's take a look at the steps and let's see how we can uh, apply them in a biblical manner. So we looked at steps one through six last time. We look at step seven. Humbly ask him, God, to remove our shortcomings. So, one, we have to be humble, and then we have to ask, and we have to ask about something that maybe has been our friend. Because how many times have our shortcomings been our friend, our buddy, because that's all we know. Right. And we cover up our shortcomings, we try to hide them, which means we're trying to actually keep our shortcomings in reality. Yeah, that's true, you know. Um, I mean, I, I can understand why people do alcohol and drugs, because life can be pretty boring if you don't, you know, if you don't have the right thing to do. So if a person's kind of stuck and they just say, I don't know what to do, I'm stuck. Oh, no, I feel better, you know. It's, like, it's just like that. You know, you have to figure out what to do. Like I'm saying, wonderful is what you feel in you when you do the things you're made to do. So discovering that, and in in lieu of uh, what the society is standing for, um, you know, we have to find it, and it may be against what everybody around us is for, what the media is for, what entertainment industry is for. And that's probably a shortcoming. Right. So when it says humbly, ask God to remove our shortcomings. Why is humbleness important when it comes to uh, recovery? Well, because, you know, we're, we're humbling ourselves to God, to a perfect being, see. Uh, if you humble yourselves, people don't like humility sometimes because they have to humble themselves to things in the world and people in the world. They have to humble themselves to their boss so they can keep their job. Right, exactly. And, and, and the, the feedback is not good. So, uh, yeah. But if you're humble to God, the feedback's always good. Do, do you believe that it's much harder for a person with pride to be able to walk in victory over addiction? Sure. You have to give it up. Say, I mean, the way to give up pride is you just say, I don't know what the heck to do. I don't know what's going on. You know? You throw it up your hands. Yeah. Okay, God. And, is, and it isn't when people, when they're at that point, they throw their hands up. Yeah, right. They don't throw them down. Right, yeah. They throw them up. Right. And, and not even realizing what they're what they're doing in the midst of it. I don't know what they I do, give but up. they I give, give up. up. Yeah. Uh, number eight, made a list of all persons we had harmed and become willing to make amends to them all. Now notice it doesn't say make amends. I tell people this all the time. It doesn't take us right to make an amends. We have to, first we have to do the moral inventory, and then we have to have God to show us anything we've missed. Then we're humbly asking to take care of it. Then it's saying that we make a list of persons. There is a process that's here. Because obviously we don't get there just right off the bat. Right. I, I, I look at what I've done and I'm not ready to, to apologize at first. Right. I may recognize it, but just don't tell me how to go and tell that person I'm sorry. But it says there's made direct man, it says made a list of all persons we have harmed, become willing to make amends to them all. Why is making amends, if it's possible, why is that important to do that when it comes to recovery? What's that have to do with me being addiction free? Well, we have scars, you know from doing wrong things to people. And uh, and if we don't open up about it, the person is left with feeling like, oh, that person's a jerk, you know, or you know, or maybe they just hurt by it and they you know, they can't do something about it. So it's a it's a good process, you know. Plus, like you we're talking about here, it's it humbles us. And that's real important. And when I look at this as we want to make amends to, to those we have harmed is if you start to make amends, it's hard to have the guilt and the shame and condemnation if you're doing something to try to correct what you've done. But if you're not doing anything to correct what you've done, then there's always that taunting that you have. And so something we're gonna see later on, sometimes you can't make amends, it just doesn't work out, it isn't the right thing to do, but at least you've done something. But if you don't do anything, there's all, how many people you met that, why do they drink? They drink because they feel guilty about what they've done and that they would just turn around and say, I'm sorry, they, they have one less reason to, to stop drinking. Right. But then that's a problem. If I have one less reason to stop drinking, then maybe I should stop drinking. But I don't want to stop drinking. So it becomes a vicious cycle. Yeah, it's complicated. Okay, <laughs> uh, number uh, 
10 says, oh, number 9 says, make direct amends to such people whenever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. So that's actually saying to make amends, that do what you can whenever possible to try to make things right. And in no way does it say here that the person has to agree to the amends. Right. It's God. You're doing it for God. You're doing it for God. And with God, yeah. Okay, uh, and what about the fact that if, you're, if your heart is right, uh, so I've had people say this, tell me if you think this is accurate or not. So I have somebody who has done a lot of harm to somebody, but that person's passed away, that ca they can't make amends. And so I have some people say, you know what, I'm going to do some volunteer work, I'm going to do some work to help out others, because it'll, it'll make up for the, what I can't make the amends. Now, the problem with that is, in, in, in that thinking, it's like a, some kind of a formula. So if I do three good deeds, then I'll cover my, my five bad deeds. But the concept is, I just want to give back after I've taken. Is that not a biblical principle? Yeah, that's, uh, I think it's more our own personal growth, you know, and, um, and doing anything that makes us humble and dissociates from any bad things we've done in the past. Okay. Number 10, continue to take personal inventory when we're wrong, promptly admitted it. That sounds very biblical. I think we're supposed to be that way every day. I mean, don't you do that? Yeah. So, if, if, if you suddenly are aware that there, there's an attitude you've had, or, or uh, uh, maybe you were snappy with somebody, whatever, right. is to take a look and say, you know what, that wasn't a good thing. Right. And it's easy to do that when you know there's a forgiving God. Right. But what if you don't know there's a forgiving God? Well, then it's just part of your personality, and, you know, it's not good. Okay, uh, is there a forgiving God? Of course. Can, can you give any, I'm, set, I'm, I'm kind of setting you up right now, uh, any evidence of a forgiving God? Is there anything you can think of that gives us evidence of a forgiving So somebody says, I don't know if there's a forgiving God or not. I think he's a mean, cruel God. I don't know if he's a forgiving God. Right. Well, the way we find that out is if we have peace after we confess. Yeah. You know? And so if we have peace, oh, there it is. If that's the part that we're not in control of. You know, and if he puts peace in our heart after we confess, then we know he's happy about it. That, that, that's, a very, that's a good one. So, because I can confess all I want, and I don't feel any better when I confess. But if I'm confessing, believing in a forgiving God, and I'm confessing to God, God forgive me, and I feel forgiven, that wasn't of my own making. Right. That's right. That is, like I said, life is an experiment. You do it, and then... You feel the peace, and that's what you want. Okay, 11, sought through prayer, and then you don't, I know you, you, you make a point on this one. Number 11, sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood Him, praying for only knowledge of His will for us and the power to carry that out. And I know you struggle with that one on a couple different things. Uh, it says, sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood Him. And your argument that meditation without... Uh, the true God is kind of vanity. Right, it's, it's a waste of time. <laughs> I have to say it that way. But. Okay, uh, and it, praying only for knowledge of His will. If we don't know the true God, how can we find out His will? Well, you know, there's two parts to this. There's uh, the, um, the verbal part and there's the experiential part. And so having, you know, one of the key things is having a high sensitivity towards God's voice inside of us, you know. Um, so, explain that for just for a moment for somebody. What do you mean by that? A high sensitivity to to God's voice and well, okay. And, if we analyze, I mean, it, it took me years to figure this one out, but if we analyze um, how we are in life, how are we are we reacting to our thoughts? Are we reacting to our subconscious? Are we reacting to reacting to other people, or are we reacting to God? So. My sheep know my voice, right? And so it took me years of meditating to hear that, to get to that voice. And to, um, you know, I, I remember I made a decision at one point that was really important. And I said, um, do I want inner peace or outer peace? See, and I was in bands, so <laughs> outer peace was a little hyper. Uh, and so I would go to rehearsal and everybody's, you know, like that, you know. And I didn't like it. So am I going to be with I don't like this, or I'm going to, or am I going to be with Oh yeah, I'll go along to get along. Mm -hmm. 
So I made a decision that I'm not going to go along to get along anymore. I want the inner peace, and I'm not going to leave it. And it's really up to me. And you think there's a difference between the inner peace and the peace that's out out there? Well, yeah, the peace that's out. Yeah, that's like uh, there's peace in agreement. So uh, when people agree on something, like uh, you know we're rock stars and you know we're going to be hyper because we we're entertainers. Right. Um, and if you go against that, then you lose the peace with the other, your fellow uh, musicians. Right. So uh, the same thing in, in a family. There's peace in agreement. And so are you going to agree with the outside or the inside? And so the ultimate victory is agreeing with God on the inside. And, that, and then he gives you the peace. And then the peace passes understanding. Right. The peace doesn't even make sense because I shouldn't have peace because I'm not going along with the crowd. Right. I'm not doing what they want me to do. And I should feel uncomfortable. I should feel uneasy. But I actually found peace. Right. So I'm with all my friends. And the Bible says uh, fornication, sex outside of marriage, is sin. It says that God is going to judge, judge that. Right. Strong enough that it says those who practice that and practice it and don't repent are going to go to hell. Right. So that's pretty strong words. So let's take that one because that's that's not a popular thing that people want to talk about nowadays in our culture. It certainly wasn't in the 60s when you were in the bands and stuff and you are in San Francisco. It was right. free sex and free love and everything else. Right. And so out of it is if that in that time frame that you're in, if you want to find peace, then they say, hey, we're all going to gangbang this woman. That the, That's what you would do right. to, to, to find peace. The problem is, is after you do that, did you find peace? Right, no. He did. Yeah. The thing is, is that <clears throat> this is the place where the society is the most off. Um, I mean, of course, they're not knowing God is one of them, but it's the male-female relationships. It's like you shouldn't even think about a woman sexually unless you're ready to make a family with her, because that's what she's made for. And uh, and and using sex in any other way as you know this pleasure thing only. Uh, it's, it's going to bring judgment. It's going to bring guilt and shame, and you're going to have to drink. And I remember when I was doing all that stuff, it's like I had a drink, you know. To try to bury the guilt, the shame, and knowing something's not right. This is, you know, I'm being abusive, this, that, and everything else. Right. And and so then what you're saying is if I just accept the Bible says that this is wrong, Right. that there's another way, whether I understand it or not, whether it makes sense to me or not, I would argue when you get to know the Lord, a lot of it makes a lot of sense. Right. More and more it makes more sense. But you're new, you haven't practiced it, you're just knowing how to practice it, doesn't make as much sense because you haven't got to see the results yet. So then you, you say, okay, I'm not going to have sex outside of marriage. I'm going to respect the women that, that I know. You're saying that there comes a place where all of a sudden you find a peace that you didn't find. That's right. Not only peace, but being in a marriage uh, that where there's a fidelity, Having little babies that are cute and fun and, you know, uh, that's a, a peak in life, you know. Uh, it, it should not be abused. The, the whole thing about sex is that there's an emotional component to it. And um, that has to be honored and respected. You know, there's, it's there for a reason. It's obvious for why a woman would want that to happen, you know. There's, there should be an emotional... Um, things that need to happen in order for her to feel safe, you know. But they drink and they go along with the society and, you know, it's a big mess. And going back to the step here, that's why we talk about prayer, seeking God through prayer, meditation, asking him to his will to us, is, again, if his will says don't do this, don't do it. If it says do this, do this, and you're saying, there's that inner peace that, that comes from that. And, and, at first, and at first there may not, you're so used to do some things that it takes a while sometimes for that that kicking in of wow this really does work. So I, I so one time I say no to sex and I don't feel peace. So it must not work. But no, you give give it give it a chance. Yeah, right. It's life's an experiment. Yeah. Like I said, yeah. Yeah. You keep saying that. that life's an experiment. It is. And and the uh, the the head professor is who wrote the Bible. <laughs> it's, it's real simple. Okay, uh, as we finish up here is uh, step 12. It says, having a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we try to carry this message to alcoholics and to practice these principles in all our affairs. So in other words, 
is to take what you've learned, take what's worked in your life, and share with others. Is there any kind of biblical principle that you can think of that talks about you learn something you share with others? It's called evangelism. <laughs> That's what we're doing. <laughs> okay, and it, 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 it is to is to share the message of the gospel, is to share the message of the love of Christ, that there is forgiveness for sin, that you can walk in victory. And so as we end with this, do you believe if somebody's truly in recovery, somebody is, you don't like that word in recovery, right? Right. You, you like it to be, you're recovered. Right. Not, not, and not, now you're in sanctification. Yeah, yeah, okay. And, and that would be a whole other topic about being set apart and all that stuff. But that if somebody is walking in victory over their addiction, would, would I'll, I make a strong statement, I think they're obligated to share what's well, going on in their life. Yeah, well, and how could you not? Yeah, what else is life for? I mean, you know, it's, it's just this never-ending selfish thing. So, so this this take that we'll end uh, the last minute we have the dry drunk syndrome. Somebody is sober; they've been sober for years. They're not taking what the LAA calls the twelve step. A lot of people are, say AA is the program for them, but they don't apply the steps themselves. So they don't try to help somebody else get sober. They're just happy. I don't, you know, I don't want to be around all those other people. Yeah. I'm just happy that I'm sober. And what you're saying is, is that's not the purpose, the meaning of life. And then you're just becoming self-centered again, which is what addiction is all about. Right. Prideful. I've been you know, sober for 30 years. You know, and just, I, there's always a tinge of pride when I hear somebody say that. You know, no, you don't have to say that. Say, you know, this, that was the thing in my past. I'm an ex-alcohol and drug abuser. You know, and now, now, what you just said, that 12th step. So now what are you doing with your life? Uh, are you are you still addicted to sports and you know addiction to fiction? Right, right. You know? So that's where for you and again, I mean, and we believe this is a it's a journey to get set free, because there's layers. Right. And so then there's one layer after another layer. So you deal with one area, uh, and I and I think we'll bring this in our next show as we talk about some kind of scientific proof that there's concepts, scientific concepts about recovery from addiction. And the, the concept that is, it goes from, the Bible says from glory to glory we're being changed. And that it's a process, it's one step to another, so there's these layers. And so you aren't even looking at an area that you thought was addiction, then when you get cleaned up, God reveals another area that can get cleaned up. And the whole purpose so you could be a person that could be more fruitful to help somebody else out. And so where does that lead? What's the ultimate approach? What did Jesus do? What did the apostles do? This is the whole thing, is to spread God, you know. And by all says they're going to get the victory if you're not doing that. Right. But, I mean, what, what do you do with your life? Okay. All right. Well, you've been listening to Dare's Home TV with Dennis Marcelino as my guest. If you have never accepted Jesus Christ in your life, then a lot of this is not going to make sense to you until you really allow God to come into your life. So what we're going to do after the show, we're going to let you know how you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, how you can see your life being changed. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, I ask of you, listen how you can accept Jesus Christ in your life so that you can live a life of victory. Go to Dennis's website, addictionfreeforever.com. Dennis has his book there and workbook. All the information you need to become addiction-free is there. Addictionfreeforever.com. Are you struggling with moving beyond the past? Are you having a hard time to forgive others, to forgive yourself, or maybe even to forgive God? Well, Seattle Open Door Church has a series that we're doing called Moving Beyond the Past. So here's some of the sessions we'll be covering. What is healing past hurts? Who needs healing? The prodigal son, God's forgiveness. Face-to-face -face encounter with God, the power of the cross, forgiveness and inner healing, inner vows and bitter root judgments, closing open doors, breaking every curse, breaking every deception, and being filled with the Holy Spirit. If you keep track with all of that we share, you will certainly live a victorious, overcoming life. And I want to let you know that you can live a victorious, overcoming life and your deserts can be turned into glorious gardens. If you want to learn more, go to our website, sodc.tv forward slash moving beyond. That's sodc.tv forward slash moving beyond. We'll have the curriculum there. We will have the videotape of each session 
So you'll be able to follow right along with us even if you're not at our church service. Yes, you can move beyond the past. Yes, you can live a victorious life. Yes, your desert places can turn into glorious gardens for others to be able to receive the fullness of victory for their own lives because of what God's done in your life. This is Pastor Rich. Do you need to know Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior? Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. Romans 10, 13 says, Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. John 1, 7 says, You must be born again. Acts 16, 31 says, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And Matthew 1, 15 says, Repent you and believe the gospel. Will you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior today? If you want to get more information, you can always go to our website to learn how to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You can go to thereishopetv.org. That's thereishopetv.org. And we have information on frequently asked questions about Christianity. We let you know step by step how to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. I encourage you to go to thereishopetv.org. That is thereishopetv.org. Also, I want to let you know, if you would like to talk to me personally, you can always give me a call toll-free anytime, 1-866-1-GOD. You have been listening to There Is Hope with Pastor Richard Dover. Through Jesus Christ, we can live a victorious life. Seattle Open Door Church, located in Burien. Committed to loving God, loving people, and loving life. Seattle Open Door Church wants you to know that regardless of where you've been or what you've done, God loves you. Their doors are open to anyone and everyone. Their services are Sunday mornings at 11. Seattle Open Door Church is located at 625 Southwest 149th Street in Burien, next to the Southwest Courthouse. So Seattle Open Door Church, our vision is loving God, loving people, loving life. Now that's a vision for a church, to love God, to love people, love life. Let me tell you something. That if you love God and love people, you will love life. You know why some people don't love life? They don't love God or they don't love people. If you don't love God or you don't love people, you won't love life. Let me tell you something else. When you love life, you will love people and you will love God. It goes both ways. And out of it, if you have a love and a passion for God, and you say, God, I just love you with all my heart. Thank you, Jesus. So You've done so much for me. Lord, I just love you. Lord, what can I do for you? That's what happens when you have true love. You, you know what God is going to answer? Love people. That's what he's going to say. He's not going to say, love me, because you already love him. Anybody know the, the, the greatest commandment? The love of the Lord thy God with all your heart, soul, mind. And the second greatest commandment is what? Love others as yourself. So loving God leads to loving people. Let me tell you, if you love God, Lord, I love you so much, what can I do? He says, I want you to love this person over here. I want you to love this person over here. I want you to do this for this person over here. All of a sudden, you start loving people, you start loving God. You don't think that you'll have some fire in you?